This video is supported by Brilliant.org. In the 1950s, a controversial social experiment took place where a psychologist named Musafar Sharif took a bunch of preteen boys, divided them arbitrarily into groups, and then got them to fight each other. Lord of the Flies style. Science was a lot more fun back then. Sharif and his team took 22 young boys aged 11 to 12 years old and took them on a camping expedition to Robbers Cave State Park in Oklahoma. They divided the boys into two groups, totally at random, and gave them a few days to kind of get to know each other. And then they brought the two groups together and had them compete for resources. Almost immediately, the two groups turned on each other, vandalizing each other's camps, destroying their things, and even physically assaulting each other. Science! It became known as the Robbers Cave Experiment, and it's gone down as one of the best examples of in-group, out-group bias. Humans will get tribal over almost anything, from hairstyles to what color shirt you're wearing. We seem to have this innate need not only to belong, but also to exclude. Whatever it is you believe, say when it comes to climate change, you probably share that with a particular political group. And you probably see the other guys as wrong or victims of a hoax or disinformation. But climate change isn't a political issue. There are numbers and measurements that we can see, cold, hard, impartial data. I've covered climate change in a few different videos in this channel, and I've gotten pretty much every comment in response to it that you can possibly imagine. Uh, so I thought it might be interesting to take some of these climate change myths and see what the actual science has to say about it. Fun! There are two types of people who are watching this video right now. There's climate change deniers, who prefer the term climate change skeptics, and climate change supporters, who prefer, well, any other term, because nobody supports climate change. And there are people who think that climate change is happening, but it's not man-made. There are people who think that it is happening and it is man-made, but it's not a big deal. And there are people who think that the whole thing is a giant hoax. So, like I said, two types of people. The myths that I'm addressing here, they come from a variety of places. There's a lot of confusion and misinformation out there, and that's deliberate. There are vested interests out there that are trying to muddy the waters to protect their bottom line, but that's not something I'm going to talk about here. Here I'm just going to focus on the myths that are out there and respond to it with what the science says. And I know for some of you that's not going to hold any water because you don't believe in the scientific establishment, you think that they're making it up for various different reasons, and this video is not going to change that. So I'm not going to talk about that here. So the first myth is the one about, um, the one about the, um... Damn it. Okay, I can't just not address this. Look, anytime there's some kind of technological change, there are moneyed interests that have benefited from the status quo and don't want that change to happen. They want to slow that change down as much as possible. In the case of the fossil fuel industry, they stand to lose hundreds of billions of dollars at the way we produce energy changes. So these moneyed interests have spent tens of millions of dollars, a bargain really, to run disinformation campaigns to sow doubt in people's minds to try to slow down that change. And this is nothing new. This has happened over and over and over again throughout the 20th century. Corporations have a legal responsibility to protect the shareholders' assets. And the more they have to lose, the more they're going to spend on lobbying and PR to try to change the narrative. The lead industry did the same thing when the health effects of lead and gasoline became known. The tobacco industry did the same thing when cigarettes became tied to lung cancer. In fact, the fossil fuel industry and the tobacco industries both used the exact same PR firm, Hill & Knowlton, going all the way back to 1956. There's a book called Merchants of Doubt that's definitely worth reading. It talks about all this. And there's the film uh, Thank You for Smoking, which is a good send-up of the tobacco PR people. But yeah, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that here. Okay, myth number one. There is no scientific consensus on global warming. People who claim this often refer to the 2007 petition that was signed by 31,000 scientists asking the United States to pull out of the Kyoto Agreement, basically arguing that climate change is not real. Now this is a huge number of people and it definitely makes it sound like there's a lot of debate out there about this and that there's a lot of scientists that disagree with it. But the only requirement for signing this petition was you needed a bachelor's degree in a science-related field of some sort. You didn't even have to actually be working in that field. You could have gotten a degree in animal husbandry and signed this petition. The fact is only 0.1% of the people who signed this petition were actual climate scientists. And this sort of expertise equivalency is something you see a lot in these debates. Now for comparison, around that same time in 2009, Peter Duran from the University of Illinois uh, ran a survey of 3,000 earth scientists, specifically earth scientists, asking them if they agreed that global warming was happening and that it was caused by humans. 90% of the respondents in this survey were PhDs, and their expertise covered everything from geology to geochemistry, geophysics, hydrology, oceanography, and paleontology. And 5% of them were actual climate scientists. 
They also collected information on how many of them actually had published works in scientific journals and how many of those published works were about climate change. In this survey, 90% of respondents agreed with the statements. And what they found was that the more expertise they have in climate science, the more they agreed with the statements. For people who had had more than 50% of their papers published on climate science topics, 97.4% of them agreed that humans are causing climate change. And a Princeton study in 2010 took a look at public statements from published climate scientists and found that, yes, again, 97% of them agree that humans are causing climate change. And in 2013, yet another study was done where they took a look at over 12,000 published articles on climate science between 1991 and 2011 and found that 97.1% of them, again, 97%, uh, supported the idea that the climate is warming and human beings are causing it. Now I know an argument that gets made here is that of course it looks like a consensus because the only papers that get published are the ones that support the global warming agenda, either because the truth is being suppressed or just because scientists live in a state of publish or perish. So if they want to get published, they have to submit articles that support that agenda. But clearly that's not true. I mean, remember, 3% of those 12,000 articles argued against human-caused global warming. That's 360 papers making that argument. So they're getting published. And besides, if a scientist has uh, ironclad proof that the scientific community is wrong, that's a huge story. Any scientific journal would jump all over that. That scientist's name would be in the papers all over the world the next day. And besides, this is the only research that gets this level of scrutiny. If a research paper came out tomorrow saying that 97% of dermatologists agree that solar radiation causes skin cancer, nobody would argue that. Nobody would pick that apart. Nobody would say that dissenting dermatologists are being stifled or question their motives or accuse them of some giant conspiracy against the sun. I started this off with a consensus question and I spent this much time on it because this is important. This is how science works. Science works on consensus. You know, there's, there's always going to be conflicting data, there's always going to be differing opinions, it's never 100%, but when the vast majority of scientists agree on one thing, that's generally where you find the truth. And just to put this into perspective, 97% is the same consensus amongst scientists that smoking causes cancer. CO2 is plant food. Yeah, because adding more food only makes you healthier. No, I get the logic. Plants need CO2 to do photosynthesis, so more CO2 would mean more photosynthesis, more energy, bigger plants, right? There's even a term that climate change skeptics have adopted for this. It's called global greening. But go and figure, it's actually a bit more complicated than what you learned in sixth grade science class. The plant's metabolism isn't based on CO2 alone. It also needs water and nutrients from the soil. It's that mix that helps it to grow. And if you have higher CO2 without a corresponding uptick in water and nutrients, it doesn't really make a difference. In fact, water is going to be even harder to come by because higher CO2 would mean higher temperatures. Higher temperatures would evaporate more water out of the plant, so it's going to need more water just to maintain the status quo, even more water to be able to make any advantage out of the higher CO2 concentration. And while many have pointed out that more evaporation should lead to more rain, uh, climate models actually suggest that that rain comes in the form of high energy storms, which we're already starting to see. And that massive burst of water doesn't get a chance to soak into the soil and in fact can remove a layer of topsoil with the runoff. Without extra fertilizer, plants exposed to more CO2 might grow a little bit faster at first, but they quickly hit a nitrogen plateau and stop growing as the soil gets depleted of nutrients. Plus, extra CO2 in some plants can cause chemical imbalances that causes them to lose their natural defenses against insects. So if you have plants in a controlled greenhouse environment where you can control the amount of CO2 and the amount of water and the amount of nutrients, yeah, extra CO2 could help. But in the outside world where you can't control all those variables, it would have little to no effect on the plant growth and can actually be harmful. Mars is warming too. This myth came from an observation by NASA scientist Lori Fenton that a 1999 composite photo of Mars looked darker than a composite photo taken in 1977 from the Viking mission. Her theory that this was a sign of global warming on Mars was published in 2007 in the journal Nature, but in her paper what she was actually talking about was the albedo on the surface of Mars and how that can affect the global climate. The albedo is the amount of light that gets reflected off of a surface, so snow and ice is a very high albedo, whereas soil and vegetation has very low albedo. And Mars famously has planet-wide dust storms that redistribute the dust around and changes the albedo on the surface. Being that the newer photo of Mars was darker, it led her to believe that the planet might be warming, and she calculated that it might be warming by 0.65 degrees Celsius. But there's been no direct evidence of this. And this was all just a theory. It was based on two photographs, and it's completely unique to Mars. It has nothing to do with what's going on here. It's actually cooling. Yeah, that's not true. 
The climate has changed before, long before humans existed, so it has nothing to do with us. Yes, the climate has changed before. That is absolutely true, and I talked about it in a previous video. The Earth goes through natural cycles due to its tilt, its irregular orbit, variations in the sun's energy, volcanic activity. There's a lot of variables. But that doesn't mean that that's what's causing it now. This is a logical fallacy. It's known as the single cause fallacy. It assumes that because the climate changed in the past and it's changing now, then it must be for the same reason. It's like saying that cigarettes can't cause cancer because people have always gotten cancer. It's just not true. But beyond that, most climate change occurs over geologic timescales, over hundreds of thousands, even millions of years, which gives life plenty of time to adapt. But there have been periods of rapid climate change in our past caused by formations known as large igneous provinces, which are kind of like supervolcanoes that spew giant amounts of CO2 and SO2 and methane into the atmosphere and overwhelm the planet's feedback loops. And this didn't go so well for life at the time. These kinds of events caused the mass extinctions at the end of the Triassic, Permian, and Mid-Cambrian eras, which led to oceans rising, ocean acidification, and a sharp rise in temperatures much like we're seeing today. Which leads me to a similar myth. Volcanoes release far more CO2 than humans do. So for one thing, there hasn't been a large igneous province eruption in over 16 million years. So there's nothing going on in the Earth right now that would equal the kind of rapid CO2 rise that we saw in the past. Depending on how active the volcanism is on any given year, the amount of CO2 released by volcanoes around the world equals somewhere between 65 million and 319 million metric tons per year. And this includes not just volcanic activity, but gases released from geological hot spots like hot springs and hydrothermal vents and stuff like that. Now that sounds like a lot, but for comparison, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, worldwide fossil fuel consumption has put 29 billion metric tons per year of CO2 into the atmosphere. That's what these two numbers look like next to each other. Another thing is that volcanoes don't just release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, they release a whole medley of gases, including sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. And if the uptick in CO2 was due to volcanic activity, we would also see an uptick in those other gases, and we're just not seeing that. In fact, sulfur dioxide levels have actually gone down 87% in the last 36 years. But Al Gore has a big house. Ah oh, yes, back to the old in-group, out-group bias. Al Gore sits on the other side of the aisle and he's made a whole lot of money on it, therefore everything he says is wrong, the whole thing is a hoax. Well, let me tell you something, as somebody who generally considers Al Gore to be part of his own in-group, fuck Al Gore. I don't care about Al Gore. I don't care how much money he's made, what kind of car he drives, what kind of house he lives in, how often he flies in polluting airplanes. I couldn't care less. What he has to say about this has nothing to do with how real it is. Like, if you don't want to listen to Al Gore, can't stand to look at his face, you think he's a shill, whatever, here's somebody else that you could listen to. Debbie Dooley. Debbie Dooley was one of the founders of the Tea Party movement, a right-wing movement, but for the past five years, she's been advocating solar and sustainable energy technology. And she doesn't do it because she wants to save the polar bears. She does it because it's more economically viable in the long run. She does it because it increases our national security because we have a safer energy grid, less vulnerable to attack. And she does it because she has a grandson with asthma and she wants to create a better world for him. This earth is not a Republican earth or a Democrat Earth. It's not a conservative or liberal Earth. So we may disagree on 85% of the issues, but we owe it to future generations of the world, to our great-grandchildren and grandchildren to work together to protect this Earth and to lead when it comes to renewables. She believes that energy conservation and sustainable technologies are perfectly in line with conservative thinking. Of course, she's had a really hard time getting people on her side to embrace these ideas. Look, Al Gore was preaching to the choir. She walked into a lion's den wearing a Lady Gaga steak suit. That's one bad grandma. By the way, you know who else agrees with the scientific consensus on climate change? The Pentagon. According to an article in the Military Times, the Department of Defense created a climate change roadmap in 2014 to prepare the military for climate change over the next 50 years. And in that report, they said, quote, a changing climate will have impacts on our military and the way it executes its missions. The military should be called upon more often to support civil authorities in the face of more frequent and more intense natural disasters. This roadmap was implemented in 2016 with the DOD Directive 4715.21 titled Climate Change Adaptability and Resilience. These plans were, of course, uh, implemented in the Obama presidency, and the Trump administration has told them to stand down on those policies, but according to the article in the Military Times, they have continued on with it anyway, because they see that it is an actual threat they need to be prepared for. Oh, and there is one more group that agrees with the climate change data. ExxonMobil. Yeah. 
In 2017, a Harvard study examined 187 scientific papers and internal company memos over the last four decades and found that 83% of peer-reviewed papers written by company scientists and 80% of the company's internal communications acknowledge that climate change is real and caused by humans. So 83% of the findings of scientists working for the fossil fuel industry actually agree with climate change data. And this might be why the company publicly embraced the adoption of a carbon tax in 2017. Now there are many more climate change myths out there, I don't have time to get to all of them, but these are some of the most popular ones that I've seen in the comments of my videos. Uh, if you hear some of your family and friends talking about some of these myths, you can use this to respond to them. And if you're a skeptic and you want to check these out for yourself, I've got links to where I got all this down in the description. I promise I didn't just make all this up. By the way, a great resource for finding climate change information, especially for dispelling climate change myths, is a website called skepticalscience.com. It's run by a guy named John Cook, and I'm happy to say I had a chance to talk with him, and we discussed a lot of the stuff that I talked about in this video, but also a lot of other climate change myths that didn't make it in here. It was a great conversation. It is on my podcast, which you can check out at this link right here. And I know there's a lot of you out there, I didn't really reference this group at the beginning of the video, but there's a lot of people who totally believe in climate change, but they just don't think there's anything we can do about it. There's a bit of fatalism out there. People think we're doomed. And I don't agree with that. I'm a bit more optimistic than that. I think that we as a species have the ability to adapt and to overcome these kinds of challenges. It's something that we've always done. It's something we're really good at. But first we have to get on the same page. In the robber's cave experiment that I was talking about at the beginning of this video, there was actually a third phase of this experiment that I didn't talk about, and it's really the most important part. After showing how easy it was to get the two groups to fight each other, they wanted to see if they could make them come back together to face a mutual threat. So they turned off their water supply, out in the middle of nowhere, in Oklahoma, in the summer. Seriously, I wish I was a scientist in the 50s. They got away with everything. The kids had to figure out how to get water flowing from a tank up at the top of the hill, and it required them to work together. They formed a line to move rocks out of the way so that they could access the water controls and fix it. It took all of them working together to solve the problem, but they did it. They put their differences aside, and they worked together, and they got the problem fixed. And many of them even said that at the end of it all, they actually felt closer to their former adversaries than they did to their own in-group. This is what we do as a species, and we have to do it now. We can come together, and we can beat this shared threat. But first, we have to recognize it. By the way, if you're interested in sustainable energy solutions, there's an entire course on solar energy from our friends at Brilliant.org. It walks you through the basics of solar energy, both in photovoltaic form and concentrated solar power, so you can get a better understanding of how we can harness the energy of the sun. Solar energy is one of the fastest growing industries out there right now, and it's quickly transforming our energy infrastructure. Here you can find out how it works, from the way PV cells convert photons from the sun into electrons, to distributing utility-scale electrical grids. And in case you haven't heard me say this before, Brilliant.org is a really unique learning site because it doesn't just throw facts and figures your way, it actually walks you through puzzles and problems and helps you to figure it out on your own, which not only gives you a deeper understanding of that subject, but gives you skills you can apply to other areas of your life. Just bang out Brilliant.org slash Answers with Joe into your keyboard and you can get free access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles and the first 295 people to sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses get 20% off your subscription for life. Brilliant is awesome. I think you'll love it. Brilliant.org slash Answers with Joe. Links in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this channel and a huge thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon that are supporting and keeping the lights on and creating a whole cool community. You really want to be a part of it. We got some new people in the tribe that just joined. I want to call them out. We got Winston T. Harrell, Pinester, Veselin Stoyanov, Andreas Sodergen, uh, Vladim Bogdanovich, uh, Patrick Hearn, Paul, Saul Pomfret, Ragon Thomas, Dr. Rena Salier, Luke, and Kirsten Fain. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to behind the scenes stuff, extras, outtakes, that kind of cool thing and other perks, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share if you like this. And if this is your first time here, check out some of my other videos. Hopefully you like those too. And if you do, subscribe because I come back with videos like this every Monday. All right, you guys go out, have an eye-opening week and I'll catch you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.